warm welcome to all of you on this very particularly uh, snowy Toronto night. Uh, for those of you who has not met me before, my name is Joanne Liu. I am the Dean of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. I would like to thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And related to that, for us to consider how best to use protect uh, and cherish the land and resources we all share is at the heart, I think, of many of the themes that is touched upon on the Housing Multitude Roundtable that was just this afternoon. And this is also central, I believe, to tonight's lecture. Addressing these questions will require many of uh, different knowledge from different disciplines. Uh, before we invite uh, tonight's lecture, we introduce and invite tonight's lecture, I would just like to take this opportunity, since this is really our first lecture of the term, I would like to give this to utilize this opportunity to give an overview of exciting public program we will be hosting this winter term. Next week, we'll be kicking off Black History, Black Futures Month with a panel discussion entitled Designing Black Spaces with Community Accountability, featuring established and emerging black designers, thinking about what it takes to include black community engagement within the practice of design. Please join us in this very room on February 1st. A week later, our faculty's very own landscape architecture faculty, Alyssa Norris, would, will be presenting her recently released book uh, titled Innate Terrain, which will be featuring the distinguishing characters of Canadian landscape architecture practice. February 16th, we will be hosting the George Baird Lecture, which this year will be delivered by Jean-Louis Cohen, entitled Unbecoming Frank Gehry. There's a lot of names in that sentence. <laughs> Uh, in March, we will begin the month with our uh, Michael Huff OALA lecture featuring the issue of Virginia's landscape architect, Julie Bartman. And on March 7th, for the occasion of International Women's Day for the following day on March 8th, we will be hosting the fantastic Madame Phyllis Lambert. She will be discussing her latest book. Uh, I won't say how old she will be this year uh, without her permission, but I just want to have everyone understand that she will be discussing her latest book published this year um, well in her 90s, so we all have a lot to do in our lives. And it will be entitled, Observation is a Constant that Underlines All Approaches. The end of March, we will also see Linda Neri of Le Neri and Who, a fantastic design and architecture office based in Shanghai with a very multidisciplinary and global practice. So in addition to these exciting lectures, we will also be hosting two exhibitions this term. Uh, on February 14th, yes, Valentine's Day, we will be launching an exhibition of recent works by Marino Tablesam, the Bangladesh architect, who is this year our Frank Gehry International Visiting Chair, and she is, and her work would demonstrate the office's championship of sustainable, contextualized, sensitive architectural design. The exhibition will be held in our Larry Wynn Richard Gallery, just, uh, just right here. And then in March, our architecture and design gallery downstairs will be hosting a new exhibition entitled Antarctic Resolution, Data Democratization and International Stations. The exhibition will feature the works of a range of international collaborators advocating for the democratization of Antarctic knowledge as it impacts climate change and global sustainability through the works of advocacy, data sharing, and the design construction of shared international research stations. So as you can see, a very 
uh, wide ranging and we're hoping thought provoking uh, lineup. And I hope to be able to see all of you to join us for as many as you can make it. Of course, we'd love to see you in all of them. For more details on the program, please refer to our website and, and sign up for any of them. And now, to introduce tonight's speakers, Jay Shin and Damon Rich, I would like to invite our own, very own Richard Summer to the podium. Thank you for your attention. Oops, hold on. I gave the, I gave the came away. Um, Thank you, Juan. So I'm very pleased to welcome Jay Shin and Damon Rich to the Daniels faculty this evening. Uh, I'm gonna start by introducing Jay Shin. Jay is trained as a painter and an architect and apprentice in both these areas. You're going to see tonight how this background comes into play in the kind of work she's doing now at Hector. After studying architecture, Jay was an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow at the New York City Housing Authority where she facilitated efforts to define and implement design principles for, for preserving and rehabilitating New York City's public housing. Her creative projects have received support from the McDowell Colony and the National Endowment for the Arts in the United States. And she's very active as a teacher as well, offering courses uh, based on her pr uh, w practice and her work with Hector at Yale the New Jersey Institute of Technology, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and the University of Pennsylvania. That's over a number of years. She's not teaching all those places at once, <laughs> uh, but um, is very active uh, in, in, uh, in teaching and practice. So Damon Rich has also worn many hats since uh, studying architecture. He served as the planning director and chief urban designer for the city of Newark for many years. He is a founder of the Center for Urban Pedagogy, CUP for short, as many of us know it, which is an internationally recognized nonprofit organization that uses art and design to increase meaningful civic engagement. Damon is also a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship, which is given to individuals whose talents exhibit, quote, extraordinary originality and dedication to their creative pursuits and a marked capacity for self-direction. Damon's also a recipient of the American Planning Association National Planning Award, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the Loeb Fellowship in Advanced Environmental Studies at Harvard University, and a McDowell Colony Residency. His work and his work with Jay Shin and Hector has been widely exhibited, including at the United States Pavilion at the 11th International Exhibition in Venice. So Jay and Damon's work offers a model for how engaging communities with questions about architecture and the built environment help us to open important questions about the equation between citizenship, politics, and power. They're deeply committed to the notion that starting with people's observations, as I guess Phyllis is gonna talk about, starting with their observations, analyses, and insights into the built form that surrounds them opens opportunities for both collective action and solutions on how to change places for the better. Tonight's, for tonight's lecture, Jay and Damon are going to focus in particular on some of the stories that grow out of their attempts to learn from and build upon certain stories, histories, and traditions that bring architecture, urban design, and planning really into the realm of what, they're, what they call popular education. So with that, I'm going to turn the stage over to Jay and Damon, and um, thank you for coming. Am I on? Yeah? Well, hello, Toronto. <laughs> Thanks to the university, Professor Sommer, and the public event staff for this chance to speak about urgent issues um, that right now shaping our living environments and future lives, and perhaps the role that people working and training in this, in this very school might play. So, we've heard a bit about the last three months of debates and demonstrations, 
around Ontario Bill 23, known as the Build More Homes Faster Act, which was just adopted into law at the end of November. We're curious to know, um, has anyone here heard about that? A couple, okay. Many, many. Somehow the right side of the room seems to have heard about it more than the left, but. Um, well, you know, uh, we tried to learn a little bit and we read in a trade publication called uh, Construct Connect that it's the quote, largest overhaul of Ontario's planning regime in decades. And it quote, encourages the creation of one and a half million homes over the next 10 years, end quote. The, the way it's written makes it sound like a pretty good thing, like all regimes need to be overhauled, right? And it's good to encourage homes, whatever that means. So how will that happen? We're told, quote, it will amend numerous statutes impacting right zoning for additional residential units, appeal rights, parkland dedication, development charges, community benefit charges, inclusionary zoning heritage, and more, end quote. While such a long list of bureaucratic jargon probably leaves most people who are not in the business glazing over, for many readers working in development and construction, this might name the so-called hoops that require so-called jumping through just to get anything built. This dry list also leaves out all of the context and the reasons that these legal processes and requirements that Ontario has created since over the last 77 years since adopting its 1946 Planning Act, why they might exist in the first place. Maybe something about recognizing that there were at least some decisions about the use of land, about the design and the development of buildings that could be not left entirely to property owners or market activity alone. However, we can begin to infer maybe some of this context and these reasons from the blowback to something like Bill 23. Investigative environmental publication The Narwhale reported, quote, one of the most controversial aspects of this bill is freezing, reducing, and exempting fees developers pay to build affordable housing, nonprofit housing, and inclusionary zoning units fees that also go to municipalities and are then used to pay for the services to support new homes, such as roads and sewer infrastructure and community centers, end quote. In other words, it sounds a bit like the financial plumbing that has attempted to make sure that society can pay for its infrastructure, which is always both physical and civic, in an economic system where private investment leads the way, this Plumbing is getting its disconnection notice, decoupling the profitable activities of land development from some of the social costs it incurs. We learn that other provisions of the bill constrain the powers of conservation authorities in considering development permissions, allow construction in the green belt with some switcheroos, and award prominent developers who are also progressive conservative donors, and in the view of the chiefs of Ontario, violate the Constitution due to the lack of consultation with First Nations. Whoops. <laughs> See the... And while we're just learning about Ontario planning, for, uh, planning law for the first time, the overall drift of this decreasing and diminishing powers and reach of the public process for approving what gets built were where different interests interact around substantial and complex design conflicts sounds awfully familiar to us as well. Because after all, we grew up in the US in the late 20th century where presidents from both main parties, Reagan to Bush to Clinton, joked that the nine scariest words in English are I'm from the government and I am here to help, and vow that the era of big government is over. So today, throughout our country, the blanket calls to cut red tapes, loosen regulations, and shrink bureaucracy remain loud and often unquestioned as fixes for widespread housing insecurity and economic troubles. In the US, 120 years after the first thorough building codes, 100 years after zoning laws, 
the tools we have created to collectively manage the design and development of our buildings and broader environment remain under attack. And today, many, these, many of these calls even come from inside the house, from architects and planners. So tonight, we hope to persuade you as designers, planners, and residents, that these conflicts around political, financial, and social processes that govern building activity are one of the greatest resources for civic education and design itself. So instead of seeing governance and regulation as negative, repressive mechanisms that slow and divert the productive force of private investment in private property, we want to emphasize how it serves as a generative, life-giving umbilical cord between our values and dreams and the world we have no choice but to have to share between our meanings and materials. So to help imagine other ways of relating to architecture, let's consider the US popular education history of citizenship schools, also known as freedom schools, and I know that there's a Freedom School Toronto, by the way. These were built, um, these were adult education programs associated with the US black freedom struggle created by people including Septima Clark, Miles Horton, Dorothy Cotton, and Andrew Young. Beginning in the late 1950s, they were associated with a Highlander Folk School based in Montauk, Tennessee, which had been operating since the early 1930s, primarily as a training center for union labor activists and grew from traditions of education for adults and communities in sometimes far away places like Denmark. So Septima Clark, who you can see here, was an experienced teacher from South Carolina who, according to her biography, devised an adult education program grounded in her conviction that lasting social change had to simultaneously emerge from and radicalize everyday experience. This approach translated, quote, adult education theory into political and community action, end quote and expanded definitions of citizenship by including training in literacy and local politics. Popular education meant recognizing the value of everyone's knowledge and experience about the subjects at hand, and then group work to unpack concrete experience and connect it to abstract values and specific actions, using what they called a non-directive approach, to force students to have the room to teach each other and draw their own conclusions, focusing not only on so-called good answers, but on the deliberative group process to reach them. The Southern Christian Leadership Council, SCLC, took on the citizenship education program in 1959 after the police shutter Highlander, and other groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, take up programs building on citizenship school ideas. Here's the SCLC's Andrew Young, who later goes on to be the mayor in Atlanta in the 80s, describing the use of the common conversation starter from Freedom Schools, where do roads come from? Young says, I remember one little exercise that everybody understood. If you go to any southern town where rich white people live, the streets were paved with concrete. Where black people live, they were dirt." End quote. Starting from sharing observations of the environment, the conversation could move to the question of who decides which streets are built and where, and which ones get paved, onto voting and the accountability structures for public works. So between 1957 and 1970, civil rights activists established nearly 900 citizenship schools in rural areas throughout the South, training teachers, registering voters, and building the constituency that would bring an end to legal racial apartheid in the US. Septima Clark said, we had to give them a plan of how these people were elected, of how people who had registered to vote could put these people in office, and how they were the ones who were over you. 
The purpose of the Freedom School, she continues, is to provide an educational experience for students which will make it possible for them to challenge the myth of our society to perceive more clearly its realities and find alternatives and ultimately new directions for action. Teachers and students in citizenship and freedom schools found ways to transform architecture and infrastructure, always physical and civic, into teachable moments for purposes of political education and organizing. Their conversations grew in the gaps between the promises of democratically determined and regulated environment one that responds, just like voting should, to fundamental humanness of residents as opposed to existing reality and its inequalities justified by racialization, economic exploitation, and technical expertise. So Freedom School students would oftentimes study laws and organizational charts with the goal of imagining that they themselves and people like them can run a democratic government. In other words, to imagine a regime where the answer to questions about ro where roads come from, their alignments, their design, their materials, is that they come from our shared efforts and collective decisions. So chapter one of our talk tonight, which does not have many chapters, is how can architects and planners learn from this Freedom School tradition? Similar to how popular educators deal with challenges of working with adults who already know a lot by rooting conversations in experiences and takeaways, architects can find advice on how to be an expert in something like roads, buildings, and parks that, unlike particle physics, everyone has an experience of. Rather than some traditions of architectural education where the first task is to disabuse students of everything they have previously thought about buildings, architects who are pop popular educators revel in exploring and drawing out as many mundane and wild experiences and theories about architecture as possible, recognizing that architecture and buildings are the same damn thing. We might also learn from popular educators' attitudes towards conflict that it is a valuable opportunity for learning, that it provides windows into the fundamental setups of our society, as well as the context for any action that we take, that any world without conflict is an authoritarian one, or one where the people in power have everyone else too shook to say anything about the rules in force. Finally, just like the imagined road created through an overall act of self-determination, we might learn something about how we can think about legitimate and accountable architecture and architecture's role in a democracy. After all, maybe most people today are as disenfranchised from the governance of the built environment as citizen education program students were from the Jim Crow voting system. So now in our work at Hector, we've been lucky to have chances to try to apply some of this thinking to real projects in the world, both in terms of the process and product of design. For a few years just before the COVID in Detroit, we worked with the city government, local foundations, community groups, and young people to create popular education programs to investigate how Detroit plans, designs, and develops its neighborhood. In advance of preparing a plan for an area home to around 36,000 people on the city's far west side, people documented the landscape, young people documented the landscape, convened to imagine the future, put together a youth woodshop in an empty Catholic school, labored with neighbors and our collaborators at Tiny WPA to construct public amenities and maybe most importantly, conducted critical interviews with a wide variety of city and neighborhood leaders and decision makers. They formulated and researched questions that had come up a thousand times in their own lives about unsafe streets and vacant buildings, how much money real estate develops make, and how a local government interacts, so many things, so many people, and so many agendas. After analyzing what they have found, they then shared it with their peers, families, and neighbors 
eventually leading a two-hour public kickoff for their neighborhood's first official plan since it was developed about 100 years ago. So we'd like to share about five minutes from Lily Reynolds Smith and Yusuf Sabor on the topic of streets and getting around. So the bitch I am sitting on is a bitch that I helped build in the project called Project No Stand Zone. Right now, the place where we're at is Henderson Middle School and Elementary. Um, I used to go to the school sixth and fifth grade. My little brother, he actually goes here now. He's in kindergarten. And, you know, it's a special place to me because, like, I had a lot of experience here, like, during the summer and school year. And, you know, like being that my little brother goes here, I come up here a lot too. And it's just like, um, this is one of the places in the neighborhood where it's starting to get a little nicer. Um, and like, I hope that this is like a place where people can look at it and say, well, if we could do that with Henderson, we could do that anywhere else too. Well, we're on Ashton and Van Buren. Right behind me, you could see a vacant lot and maybe a vacant house that was caught on fire. Not sure, looks like. Look so. Very common. If you look down there, there's a, a vacant house, and these two vacant houses are side by side. There's trash all over the floor, and you could see a vacant garage right over there. And the roads are so bumpy. If Well, this road condition is actually okay, but it's just, it's bumpy. If you go on different streets, there's gonna be cracks everywhere. It looked like there was an earthquake on that street. Take it from me. We in the River Roof area, and we wanted to show the parks, the hills, and it's the hill over there. <laughs> and it's like on the other side of the roof, it's animals, like horses and many more, and swimming pools on the other side. Good evening, everybody. I'm Yusuf, and next to me is Lily. Say hi, Lily. Hi. Okay, here's what I know about streets and getting around. When I'm on the sidewalk, I tend to get in the street because there is no room and I don't like walking near abandoned houses. I know a little bit about cars and trucks, and if you see here, my elegant piece of drawing. So, this is a video clip of us driving down Warren Avenue like other Warren Hill people do. And, so, and there's always so many potholes and there's cracks. It gets so rough on the road. And plus, people drive too quick. Too quick. It's dangerous. I agree. I had three childhood friends die from an accident. Just like this person said, I'm very scared when it comes to crossing the street. Oh, really? I'm very sorry to hear that. We need to have more time for the pedestrians to cross because there's not enough time for early and young youth to cross the streets. This is a sixth grader at Carter. Also, things that the streets and sidewalks are kind of dangerous to walk on. process. 
All right, you can see more at Cody Rouge and WarrendalePlan.org if you want to see how that relationship turns out in the end. So at the other end of the design process, at the end, we've been able to try ways to embed and engrave the stories and spirits of a place into its material surfaces and design, with an emphasis on the conflicts and contingencies that have brought it to be the way that it is. In Newark Riverfront Park, the city's first official public access to the river in 90 years, the design includes dozens of narrative installations we designed with Weintraub Diaz Landscape Architecture and MTWTF, including an orange boardwalk made of recycled PVC so it didn't have to be wood colored that has been taken as a reference to the water chakra, to a safety edge for the town, and to Agent Orange, the chemical weapon that was once manufactured along the river that became the subject of an environmental catastrophe and scandal internationally and leaving 17 miles of this tidal river, a serious hazard for all life forms. So in the public realm, you see not only the lawfully required warning signs about eating fish, but a more spirited story of what happened, focused on the actual conflict and organizing and struggle, and rooted in living memory to explain the strange architectures that we see all the time, like this 10-foot thick concrete cap over the former Agent Orange factory. You see its effects on the local living environment and the still ongoing legal and political battle to repair the river and hold those who profited from its destruction accountable. As designers, we imagined all these stories and characters emerging from the mundane site furnishings like a railing that could introduce the wild multiplicity of plot lines that intersect along the river selected from a variety of possibilities that we could actually test with people who knew things about what went down, to welcome people to this place and beckon them to enter, maybe with their science teacher to make a rubbing from this water jet cut rail that begins with a history of the technology of sewers from the outhouse to the first pipes to the overdue realization that too much poop in the local waterways caused problems for everyone, which led to the construction of the first sewage treatment plants, through the ongoing challenges of increased runoff and combined sewer overflows, just like y'all have here in Toronto, as well as ending with the individual and collective actions that might improve the situation. As an homage to Archigram's log plug, there are annotated log drawings that are nestled among the grasses that maybe let you know about a giant innovative in its day ball box smelter that also occupied and put a lot of lead and heavy metals into the soil while realizing tremendous profits from around the world host to dramatic labor actions and petty thievery and pretty regular, as far as we understand, explosions. Um, or the story about how community members, maybe most importantly, prevented much of this open space from being taken over in the early 2000s for a sub-minor league baseball stadium, which led to the existence of this very space. And signs that chart the relationship of the river to the layout and the architecture of the whole town and its surroundings, including at least one building from each neighborhood that we know people can recognize, that are then routed and painted into the wood, in order to hopefully open up the possibility that by supporting the people, the organizations, the businesses, and the movements that steward this shared space, our design work might help open the landscape for schooling in freedom, where people can recognize and celebrate commonality and differences, where performers and audiences merge on the house music dance floor, where the sum of these life energies of sustenance and resistance reconstitute the landscape, and as you might imagine, very, very many good people were needed to bring such a thing to life. So, chapter two. <laughs> uh, we really do love design most of all, uh, but this chapter is not about that, but about the conditions for design, what we might call the regulatory imagination. So I wonder, who here has had the experience of going to a planning office? All right. Um, I myself once worked uh, in such a place um, where democracy and design uh, come into contact with each other. And 
we spent a lot of our time, as planners do, on a lot of details of how things got built in the most mundane of ways. So, so struggling over meetings to put windows onto windowless facades, to keep buildings from having too much foam on them, to have uh, the, the highest end corporate plazas not quite as intimidating as their architects would like, to add tiny little pedestrian access ways to drive through fast food restaurants. So for example, this is a restaurant called Applebee's, and like most people, uh, if you arrive by bus or uh, by walking, because over half of residents in the city uh, don't have access to cars, you can either walk all the way down the block to enter where the cars do, or you can do like I do, like most people do, like this woman does, and just walk across this protective shrubbery. And so this led to, say, a debate with Shaq, the basketball player who grew up in Newark, and his development partners who wanted to, to expand the only movie theater in the town. And this was their design for doing it. The gray was existing. The orange was proposed. And so we had about 30 minutes before the mayor. We had to accompany the mayor to a meeting. So we photoshopped it and said, hey, instead of this, why don't we just do this? It's not rocket science, but it's the best we can do in 30 minutes. So everyone celebrated. Um, the thing was actually built that way, and now you you, in fact, can exit the theater and catch your bus without having to cross active lines of cars. Small victories, just like a small victory when you get your mayor to say some things that almost make sense about urban design in an article in Vogue magazine. And the story doesn't stop there, it continues. A similar but more extended work on urban design conversations when, was when we worked with the city uh, to discuss a new shiny high-rise in Newark. What was missing in the rendering for the North American headquarters for the company, which they use most uh, of the, for the most of the reports and uh, meetings with high visibility? Well, they were kind of hidden as an annotation in small text in the engineer's drawings eight feet tall fences on the facade fr building frontage of uh, a, a to the sidewalk. A set of process, um, and, and, and so in a set of process now we call at the office drawing to drawing battle, we drew in perspective exactly what they were proposing, this fence along with the possible design alternatives for this building where most workers came from outside of Newark, directly funneled in from the train station or parking structure via Skybridge, not having to ever set foot in the sidewalk of our city. We documented the back and forth of design changes. And I still recall one of the executives saying that this was because they were, quote, very aware of the concerns from wives of their workers who have come to come into New York, New York City to work every day. And when a young New Yorker, Miles Chang, heard about this back and forth between the city and developers, he submitted his petition to the planning. Uh, planning board signed by other young Newarkers likening the corporation to Oscar Wilde's selfish giant who put a fence around his garden. So after all that, this was what got built, um, a fence slightly lower in height, but the good side of it is that it's low enough for me to reach over and open the gate from inside so I can walk through into their garden. So all these kinds of struggles and fights about how Newark gets built were not for lack of ideas. In fact, the city had spent millions of dollars over decades on all kinds of top shelf consultants to write out its master plans. But when it came to implementing that into the actual uh, resolution of law, um, from setting the minimum qualities for housing, uh, for rules for how the buildings are used and designed, uh, for larger systems for reconstructing urban landscapes. Um, the actual maps that we were using when I first started working in the planning office in 2008 had been amended multiple times over the years with markers to the point that my colleagues would get into debates about what the actual writing on the map said. And because the city had not revisited the laws for 60 years, um, uh, this basically was a really good reason that you might ask for a variance for anything, right? Because this legislation is so out of date. 
So before we did anything else, we made this chart which simply broke down the parts of city government and their functions to process the decision making around what gets built and who builds it. Then we worked on a comprehensive rewiring of the rules, which we called the Newark Zoning and Land Use Regulations, affectionately referred to as the Nuzzler. Um, I apologize to all the real policy heads in the room. We're not gonna get into all of the debates, of course, that went into writing the zoning and where we came down on various things. We will uh, try to uh, convince you that it's a very easy to use document. Uh, it no longer has a lot of mysterious scratching on, on historic kinds of maps. And you know, what it really required, which was new for me as a designer, was really coming to a decision about which of the problems we face are individual problems, and which of them can't help but be shared problems. What are the things of all the things in the built environment that we actually want to try to make rules about and enforce? And that came down to such philosophically abstract questions as, how many categories of restaurants should we have for laws, and what should we call them? So alongside uh, this technical work, now, oh, I get to, now I get to sell the yeah, yeah. story sorry, alongside this technical okay. work. Yeah. We worked with neighborhood groups to put together a physical model, first in the city's history of the entire Newark, trying to visualize this Nuzzler in effect. We brought suitcases, model building materials to kitchen tables, church basements, classrooms, or wherever big and small neighborhood groups will, willing to host us in a work session, painting the very buildings in their neighborhoods in candy-colored land use colors. And the local architecture school, New, York, uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology, got involved to lend a hand. And when the model was done, we installed it in the <clears throat> we installed it first in the library and then in the city hall. All our past mayors visited, like Mayor Ken Gibson on the left. Uh, well, Where's Mayor Ken? Mayor, mayor Ken Gibson on the left, first black mayor of a major US East Coast city, and J.D. Williams, AKA Bodie, from the TV show Wire, AKA Proud Newarker. And the model was used, most importantly, as a teaching tool to tell stories of people power planning Newark like this story of community organizing to stop highway, cutting through the city in the, in, in the, in the late 1960s. Here, where the story is told by Junius Williams, a longtime Newark organizer who came here as a young man at the charge of SNCC, the major force in the popular education movement we talked about earlier. So following the tenets of popular education, trying to learn from that tradition, we designed a zoning workshop, a set of discussions and activities about this new law, the Nuzzler, um, including where buildings should go, uh, how tall and big they might be allowed to be, uh, if we should allow building facades with no windows to exist, like this one. Um, we were able to test out different ideas and facilitate discussions and gather people's observations and start debates and fights using cutouts. And we could recognize and deal with how these material objects participate in agendas and disputes across the city, how they are involved in shared advocacy agendas. We discussed the red flags of what zoning can do and can't do. And when the Nuzzler was adopted with the support of residents and community groups from across the city, who each supported at least a set of the details that this would bring into effect in the law, um, it uh, was, I think, a real testament to the understandings built through this kind of process. One minor but tangible change, which we know that you have a very nice version of here in Toronto, um, that came out of these public conversations was adding to the basic state or province law that you have to send a registered letter to property owners within 200 feet. It, for the first time in the city, required you'd actually post a sign on the property. So it's rare that you open a Facebook or a social media in Newark and don't see some kind of discussion and debate headed up by one of these photographs. As in a collective project, it again took many, many hands and, uh, you know, we like to think that it wasn't simply 
a, a process of making the city more transparent, but putting these regulations on the table so they, they could be examined with their regulatory and their physical context, um, just like I think the exhibition downstairs does. And now this work of setting rules for how and where we build is just one part of planning and designing the city. Because the, the rules does not end the conflict, but rather actually set up more detailed conflicts as we design and build physical places. So that's the topic of our third and final chapter. We've been working on a design, a neighborhood plan, uh, around Mifflin Square Park in Southeast Philadelphia, where we try to put to practice what we describe as design with organized community in urban form and its materiality. It is a park in a dense residential area where a coalition of neighborhood organizations have been working together to bring improvements to the park especially trying to leverage the mayor's promise to use money from new soda tax to rebuild parks and rec centers that haven't received improvements in decades. It is a racially diverse neighborhood. In addition to longer standing African, Irish, and Italian American residents beginning in the 1970s, the neighborhood became home to many people arriving as refugees and immigrants initially from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and later from Bhutan, Burma, Mexico, Honduras, and more. It is an area um, low in income with residents burdened by housing costs. So we were hired by Nason Resident Coalition, and the work began in 2016 with the background of Trump's election, and talks of building walls and Muslim bans were in the headlines. So this park is incredibly well used. It's one of the densest neighborhoods in the Philly region, and you can tell that people are looking for some space. It's full of energy and people. At the same time, people see lots of room for improvement, in including finding better places to sit so people don't have to bring their own chairs, safer places for kids to play so they don't have to knock over the portage on to climb up on the storage building. And sometimes residents took these matters uh, into their own hands. Oh, and I should also mention uh, vending at the park has been a huge thing, but also ven uh, unlicensed vending getting shut down after there's uh, an incident of violence or something like that. Um, so uh, oftentimes residents over the course of the park's history have taken its design into their own hands by, for example, building volleyball courts, or like you see here, courts for Chakra, the, the foot volleyball. Um, but sometimes they built it too close to where the elders play cards, so they're always coughing off of the dust. And uh, when it rains, it creates a giant mud puddle. So as a critical extension to the existing conditions study for the park, uh, we worked with young people who joined us through the city's summer youth employment program and the local mural arts organization. And we were charged uh, by the neighborhood group to use uh, our wits and our innocent looks to answer one single question. This is us looking innocent. Uh, the question was, what does Southeast Philly have to do to get Mifflin Square Park rebuilt how it wants? which meant not only addressing the physical conditions of the space, but the social and governance systems that determine its future. So we began with brainstorming our experiences in that park and other Philly parks, and did site surveys of the dog poop and the cigarette wrappers and maybe a, you know, a needle or two, um, which we recorded uh, in a drawing. We got to go to the free library and explore the archives to see how the park really gave rise to the neighborhood. Uh, we got to visit uh, neighborhood groups and different kinds of city offices to conduct critical interviews, kind of like you saw in Detroit, uh, in order to document their operations. Uh, we got to learn about some of the long-term conflicts and politics around the park, and we learned that even though oftentimes reports of violence were racialized and attributed to the most recent immigrants in the neighborhood, that these issues go back much, much further, and that generations before us grappled with the same problems. We got to document many interesting people that we met in the park, uh, the places around the park, the objects in it, 
uh, and then took these things back to make these large-scale drawings about things like, who runs this park? Uh, how does a park get rebuilt? Uh, how do you make a coalition to get that kind of thing done? We made this specific drawings a tribute to the MC Meek Mill, uh, so it's called Park Dreams and Nightmares. And it imagines what would either make Mifflin Park a dream park or make it a nightmare. And with all of this, we documented and analyzed the different organizational stakeholders, their resources, what they could gain from the coalition, what they could contribute, in order to unpack the details of what would be the political power building necessary to get uh, the park rebuilt. And we brought these very drawings back to the officials and community leaders and discussed them at the park and their offices. And after this initial work done by young people, the Neighborhood Coalition made a fold-out poster introducing organizations involved and civic information that the students um, had gathered to every school kid at the neighborhood schools in eight different languages. We think that this work helped make policy public making the politics and regulations of building neighborhoods visible to people who live there. What followed were a series of small design conversations where we would show up at an existing community group meetings with a suitcase full of stuff. We often co-facilitated these meetings with community design leaders nominated and paid by the Neighborhood Organizational Coalition there would be a mo that there would be mod we would there we would model out what makes a good playground or how many seats you need to play a good uh, card games. We discussed things like how many sport courts we can fit into the park, and where they should actually go. Some of the most important moments in these conversations were the interactions, like uh, a man who said, "My family uh, just one generation ago came up north." Uh, from North Carolina straight to the big city, uh, right here, and you know, it really shook them up. And this woman, uh, a Korean woman from Burma who had just come to Philly three years earlier said, that's so crazy, that's exactly what happened to me. And so allowing us to imagine how this park could more directly reflect the exuberant cultures of the neighborhoods, draw in and partially refashion the identities that intersect with it. Those are those people I was talking about. Um, and so then the designs we made, uh, they got brought back to the park uh, to try to expand the number of people who cared enough to help prepare the ground uh, for a park design worth doing. And it was these conversations that allowed us to create a few priority design objectives. Uh, that, uh, like for example, the first one is repack the suitcase. Um, because everyone in the park had become familiar with how its design had evolved over time through these incremental changes, um, which made the park feel even smaller than it is. It's about four acres. Uh, you can do the conversion. Um, and it's divided with all these small pieces of grass, and there's curves, and there's grade changes with the sidewalk. Um, so what we started saying was, well, we've got to like unpack and repack this suitcase to consolidate and organize its activities. So we discussed uh, many possibilities of how exactly we might pack this suitcase, um, many of the times in multiple languages. And these conversations about reorganizing the location of various activities at times brought out really strong tensions and conflicts around the park. Um, so for example, when we were talking about the location of a new very small building with bathrooms and a meeting room, people felt that it could not be on the side of the park that they called the Asian side, and it also couldn't be on the other side of the park where very unique in the United States context, uh, black and people who have come to be known as white uh, would say, oh, those are our people versus their, their corner. Um, so the final layout of the park, uh, not just designates the spaces for these various activities, but makes visible to the neighbors the reasons why they have been configured in order to make room for everyone. And that notion, make room for everyone, became yet another slogan for everyone. We made drawings about how we need to make rooms for everyone, a sports yard, putting foot volleyball courts near the basketball courts, um, out of the way from where the grandmas play cards, uh, places where young people can luxuriate, climbing up high, but in a safer way. 
keeping the currently popular seating and gathering area at the southwest corner of the park, but now with more room and comfort, a stage for our performers, and with new kinds of rooms now, with meditation circles or adult fitness areas. We had to figure out in the design the center of the park, or the, the, this crossroads, um, where it's currently this large circle with a spray shower. Uh, it's kind of an over-large plaza to have a conversation across, uh, but it really is the place that everyone walks through on their way somewhere else. Um, so the goal was to give a more formal acknowledgement of the center of the park where these things are going on. Uh, this is the existing. Um, uh, by having a meeting room, uh, as well as uh, some vertical markers as it come up through some of these discussions, uh, to have seating at the edge of these lawns, and a large group platform um, the way that many people uh, in uh, Laos or Cambodia would oftentimes have outside. Um, you might have seen this in Reply 1997 if you're into K-drama. Uh, the building design takes its form from architectures of the surrounding area to create recognizable silhouettes. And the form extends to the adjacent uh, fences for the sports yards. On the playground, uh, the last time the park saw a major improvement was in the 1990s uh, when the local football team had donated uh, this playground, which is now aged and pretty crowded. Um, so we talked all kinds of ways that it might be more challenging with different types of play equipment uh, beyond just, say, your typical uh, swings or a lonely kind of play tower. Um, it was really important uh, to create separate areas that were identifiable through color and design for different ages because we heard so many stories about how the teenagers kicked the tweens off the basketball court. So the tweens went over and kicked out the like 10 year olds out of the playground. So the 10 year olds went over and like beat up the three year olds or something. Uh, somebody told us that no matter what you make, it will be used for bullying. Uh, so uh, all of this is surrounded by a shared spray ground um, with the main diagonal paths across Let's the park. Let's move on to the entry. Yes. Okay. So from these kinds of discussions, another slogan became familiar to coalition, make it South Philly, but with some perks. So here's an entry. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the story of creating an entry where we were recently able to make that happen, make it South Philly but with some perks, when the Philadelphia Water Department decided to implement their citywide green infrastructure program in the Mifflin Square, having to open up a large portions of the park surface at the corners. We asked them to consider how the residents have been actually designing the improvement for the entire park. And instead of repaving the park when they're done, as it was before, after the GI installation, um, that they should use our design and make the entrances more welcoming with better seating furniture, with trees, um, better planting. And after all these entrances, um, uh, and after all these entrances right now, were some of the most popular sitting areas in the park. We have all kinds of better, act, better ways of activate the corners and edges of the park into the sidewalk, the border um, where the, a lot of social activities happen. So once we worked hard enough to convince the water department, parks department, and the neighborhood group to work together, we found more funding to develop the design. We modeled our ideas, we sketched, and arrived at this carpet-like pavement pattern that reminded a map of different countries. We had to drive three hours west from Philly to where they make the Hanover bricks in order to visit their overflow pile to pick out pavers that helped us save a little money. Uh, we were able to adjust our design to what was actually available and then work with the water department to make sure that these bricks came on board with our design. Um, when we were visiting and documenting the construction site, and when it was done, uh, this was before, and this is it now. Um, we were able to bring on some boulders. And maybe most of all, people wanted to know who had paid the extra eight grand that it could be bricks and not just naked concrete. And so uh, these are the people who made that possible. Uh, 
with all of the languages that are today, as far as we know, spoken in the community, and with a couple that come back in time. Right next to it is an engraved stone uh, that also tells the story of why the entry came to exist in the first place, that traces the chamber that lies underneath this entry down to the pipes and then over to that sewage treatment plant uh, before it hits the Delaware River. So the story of the chapter three um, at the Mifflin Square Park doesn't end there. We continue to work with the park at the park uh, these days following the citywide flow of money and policy changes for rebuilding the parks. And so recently we were able to work on a neighborhood, a neighborhood plan for the area, which we published uh, a newspaper along with the chapters on housing, commercial corridor, and, uh, and other essential neighborhood plan elements. We included the coalition's past and future work for the park. Thus ends chapter three. So to conclude, and kind of give a little coda, we wanted to share an update from the young people and the others in Detroit that you heard from earlier. Uh, because they, along with us professionals, uh, were finishing the Cody Rouge and Warrendale youth-centric neighborhood plan uh, just as COVID hit. These neighborhoods, just like gigantic parts of Toronto and Ontario, are mainly single-family houses on individual lots connected by wide roads and interlaced with the other components of modern suburban development, commercial corridors, schools, parks, and more. In their proposals, after peeling back some of the human and organizational layers behind the problems that they saw every day, we worked together to visualize incremental ways of reconfiguring this modern suburban landscape that has become quite unfriendly to them. So uh, these drawings give a little bit of a tour to these, you know, probably recognizable, you know, nothing, I think, earth shattering, but improving the ways that these young people can get around, uh, the ways that they can get access to vacant lots owned by the city for various kinds of activities, the way that they might re remake a spot in front of the existing library so it's a little bit more amenable to hanging out, uh, maybe even create their own custom sneaker store uh, on the main drag. Imagining different types of buildings uh, made for even businesses that they themselves might want to might want to begin And so you can see you know, I think maybe in a way that would uh, Take inspiration from some of the drawings in the exhibition downstairs the way that these landscapes that are not that old about a hundred years might begin to be reconfigured according to the desires of an active set of residents and so uh, we wanted to let you know that uh, when we are back home in Newark, New Jersey, we will eagerly follow how you all here in Toronto and Ontario are recommitting to solidarity, backing away from primordialism, and dismissing the red herring that we can dispense with or radically reduce the social practices that we are developing to build and maintain the world that we want. After all, we're only 100 years and change into this grand experiment of building codes and zoning and planning on this continent, of realizing the social, ecological, financial, and political systems and sensibilities we will need to survive what is coming. It is surely messy and stressful and chaotic process, no doubt. So let's remember the words of Septima Clark. She said, I have a great belief in the fact that whenever there is chaos, it creates some wonderful thinking. I consider chaos a gift. So now the young people in Detroit are struggling with city agencies, development corporations, and pro formas to try to make their desires real. Looking at this org chart that they call the football diagram, and developing their understandings and savoir-faire for all the pieces that move together to make a landscape, a community, a neighborhood, and a city. And learning that there's no more complete, hopeful, and heartbreaking answers to the question of where roads come from than the ones that you live through beautiful struggle. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to do a little Q and A. I'm 
coming, I'm coming. when you gave it to me. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for that. Um, there's so much to take in. And um, I guess I have two questions to begin, and then I want to open it up to the audience. Um, I do, maybe this is my second one, but I, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your collaboration, you know, um, like how that works, because I think it's especially interesting for the the students and others mm -hmm. to understand. Um, I mean, I understand a little bit because, by the way, they lectured in the class I gave yesterday, and they talked about the different their different backgrounds and how it comes together in this work. Um, but I want to start with um, the way in which your work tries to with, with your methods of observation, because while I very much appreciate your um, your kind. Um, references to the show downstairs and to the work that uh, Michael Piper and I and many others have done to bring that together. Um, we actually submerged in that show a lot of the, uh, let's say, empirical observation and, and, and things we understood about the suburban landscape. In fact, I think Naomi um, Chris, one of our uh, colleagues that works for the school, is here, and she asked us when we were putting it together, where, why don't you put all those photographs that you took of of what it actually looks like in Toronto's suburbs in the show, so people can know like um, what this place is about. And we, for various reasons, decided not to do that, um, to leave it very abstract. Um, but you start from a very different place, which is a kind of the gritty reality and kind of, um, not, and not just your own representations, but uh, I think as, as was really explained so well here, the way in which other people see and describe through words and sometimes very naive drawings. So, um, so I guess I'll, I'll just bridge those two questions together. How does this commitment to starting with the way people see and understand and describe their places for themselves get brought together with your own modes of observation and design? Uh, and then even in that more complicated, the two different ways in which the, you guys go about it in terms of your backgrounds. Is that, is that a little too yeah, tough? No. <laughs> um, well, I think that I can take that question from a personal note because I do find the students um, respond to sort of my career trajectory very interesting and helpful. Um, so I went to architecture and architecture is actually my second career. So I was one of those older students in architecture schools. So by the time I went to architecture school, I had this desire for say authorship kind of out of my system. I worked for, you know, um, worked as an artist, practiced as an artist, made nice drawings and um, they were mine. But what drew me into architecture as a field is that gritty sort of reality of our existence in this world, um, those that cannot be covered with concretes and nice words and um, what we may see in slogans and campaigns of political parties, you know, like all the stuff that happens on the day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's where, come, where that sort of desire to keep you know, documentation real. And um, one of my closest friends now, um, Mindy, Dr. Mindy Fulala, who is a social psychologist um, who works on the public health impact of uh, displacement of people, have given me an advice once and said, Jay, you just have to learn to talk to people like they're people. And so to me, this way of representation and documentation has to do with just learning how to talk to people like they're people. Well, also, I guess, biographically, I mean, I feel, feel for me, like, it might go back to two, you know, two maybe forces in tension. So I'm from uh, St. Louis, the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri. And Missouri's uh, slogan, you may know it, is the show me state. So there's kind of like an attitude of, uh, you know, maybe cynical skepticism, you know, maybe skeptical cynicism uh, on one hand, 
But on the other hand, you know, growing up in the middle 20th century suburban landscape as it does exist uh, in that part of the world um, was both a mysterious experience in terms of like where did this landscape come from? Because arguably with functional zoning, you could say that it was all set up to hide all of the things, right, that you actually need to run a community, right? I mean, there was like a you know, a dump and, and other things, but they were like kind of, you know, those gray, those gray areas. So I feel like between like this inbred skepticism and this like deep mystery of the suburban landscape, you know, it left me, I think in, in a lot of young people, I, I definitely felt identification with our collaborators in Detroit, having a kind of absurdist attitude towards this landscape, right? Because you end up doing like bizarre things like, spending a lot of time in the 7-Eleven parking lot, for example, or Tim ha Horton. having, or, or the, yeah, or uh, Slurpees, you know, getting chased by police, you know, because of your trespassing on like a golf course that happens to back up onto like all of your, you know, where you live, you know, an apartment building or something like that. So, you know, I feel like, you know, I also was maybe like forced into an appreciation of that kind of landscape, even as it was so mysterious and, and baffling. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is, you would think from the point of view of staying in Toronto's downtown, uh, that Toronto is a world of plenty, and it is. It's a very wealthy city, and, um, and um, although everyone complains that the city doesn't have enough money to do things, but relatively speaking, when we think about places like Newark, um, it's an extremely privileged place. But if you go out north of here, a little far enough, some of the places are not so different from uh, Mifflin, <laughs> Mifflin Park, uh, and um, it's important for us to see that and not forget it. So, um, um, you know, and the interesting thing about the park you show, because Newark, you can stand in Newark and you're looking towards Manhattan, right? The, uh, the promised land there. Uh, it's a couple rivers over, but that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, okay, uh, let me take some questions. Can we get, we, you, um, just take the mic. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, it's very impressive the amount of community participation that you were able to um, have with these projects and it's really beautiful to see. I'm wondering if you can give um, I, uh, your experience on what is most successful for having community participation and engagement, and how do you promote that in that community? It's good to have a community that you're afraid of, because they're organized, right? And they actually like have, you know, the functionality to be able to deliberate and decide on like things, you know, that are the priorities, you know, um, you know. Could definitely say a lot of other like nice things about them, <laughs> but but I think that that is actually important, right? And it's definitely important if they're inviting us in to support an effort that maybe has not yet won the favors of the local or the state authorities. You know, so you know, a, a recent client of ours is trying to undo an eminent domain of their neighborhood that has been done to create a giant arena for the buying and selling of cows once a year, right? So you know. We could talk to those people about interesting projects that we might draw about that, but unless we actually have a sense, you know, unless they're serious enough to raise the money to hire us, right, and we have a sense that they actually are organized enough to pull something off, then it's probably not going to be a very worthwhile project. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Um, amazing presentation. Um, I'm really struck by the diagrams that you do to kind of take invisible systems or in really complex issues like zoning or combined sewer outlets and putting it into the public domain in a super legible and understandable way, but in a beautiful way, by the way. And I'm wondering if through your experience after these parks have opened for a while or these documents were disseminated, if it created any sort of sense of collective broader understanding of the value of shared infrastructure, for example. Like, do people now believe in investing in blue-green infrastructure? Or has it changed? The, did it have an effect beyond the didactic 
understanding of this is how a system works, but instead sort of galvanize us to understand, okay, as a community, we should be better with how we dump water on the streets, or there is a loophole or a system that is not working, should we figure out a way to do it? Had, had it had a positive or negative effect or an effect at all beyond educating or empowering? Right, yeah, maybe I can answer that question in conjunction with an earlier question that um, in many ways we see our work not so much as community engagement, but designers joining an existing set of coalition building. So we are a part of that larger effort that hopefully existed enough to hire us designers uh, to participate in them, which, is, which makes it difficult for us to sort of take on these sort of demands of how do you measure success? Like what are some of your data to know X, Y, and Z, right? I think that some of the things that tell us that there is a that there's an impact or that is, this is making policy public is worth work worth doing is seeing the coalition get bigger you know maybe two neighborhood groups that really never saw a commonality before actually come to the same meeting and talk about the location of the bathroom building, to me is a tangible way of measuring that change. Um, and then as designers, there's such joy in seeing things get built. Um, you know, when the, the little corner in Mifflin Square Park opened, I took my parents, we drove down to Philly and, you know, and so there, there's that, there's that, that sort of like the personal joy as a designer, making drawings, that material exploration, that detailing of the bricks, um, that stuff allows me to measure. So I think that it's just being aware of who the circle of coalition have become and also seeing the stuff getting built. You know, the, the storytelling capacity you're asking about that, that describes through kind of narrative, like the built environment, so, you know, some of what's invisible gets made visible, has a, you know, kind of pedagogical, it, it, it could inspire coalitions, not just bring existing coalitions together. You know, probably the best feedback we got on the show, um, one of the best feedbacks was from a colleague here on the, on the, at the school who's not an architect, who's on the staff who said, um, I went through it, and who lives actually in the suburbs of Toronto, and said, you know, I'll just never be able to see where I live the same way again. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't understand, like, a plan you to, like, like how, how it came to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a basic thing that we, you know, you know, we had this whole debate today in our session downstairs about um, whether the public needs to understand zoning, right? Uh, yeah. And how important that is, and whether, uh, whether or not that's empowering, but um, you know, you're asking a much more basic question. Yeah. Doesn't don't citizens and people need to understand, you know, how the built environment is made if they are going to feel a sense of empowerment to yeah. get involved in remaking it, yeah. right? Yeah. I just want to add one more thing to yeah. now that you're talking about it. That maybe my answer to your question was maybe too soft. Just want to clarify that Hector does do data collecting. We're good at mapping. <laughs> we do surveys. We do all the stuff that the, pract the practice is required to do and is helpful for bringing all kinds of people into the process. So I just wanted to make sure that it's not for all the joy of Jay pouring concrete, mm. but um, that plays a big part of it. Let's see what, what's on people's okay. minds. Yeah, I think sometimes, and this came up in the class I'm teaching this week, there can be an idea that there are a couple of options for designers. You can be the kind of designer that cares about theory, or you can be the kind of designer who cares about communities. And you've done a phenomenal job drawing a very clear line between the theories that are coming, the democratic theories of the Freedom School, and the community-engaged work that you're doing. This is phenomenal, by the way. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that and tell us a little bit more, I know you guys both read a lot, if you can tell us a little bit more of, about some of the influential theories or thinkers that are 
behind your work and also maybe any advice you might have for students. I think sometimes it's great because there's more freedom, but sometimes you can feel disconnected when you're in school, right? You're working, you're reading a lot of theory and you're wondering what to do with it. So any, um, yeah, thoughts of more on what theories are important to you and advice for students trying to make that connection? Well, we can tell you the readings that we got to do together with uh, some of the students in Professor Summer's class, uh, you know, which I think. I uh, love when you call me professor. Yeah, so. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, one of them was, um, uh, what's the name of the Hooks piece? Teaching to Transgress. Yeah, the, book, the book. book is. Yeah. Um, the Dream House. The Dream House. What, what is it? The Dream House by Bell Hooks. Um, you know, she really raises a lot of questions that we tried to allude to with that slide from another architecture school that says architecture building, like so funny that it says that in the elevator, <laughs> to me at least. Um, that, uh, you know, that, you know, I think that she really questions, right? Like our cultural imaginaries and the ways that we silo them. Uh, another piece that we read was from a book by a planner named John Forster. Maybe people have come across uh, a book called uh, Planning, in the F in Planning in the Face of Power, which I got to say, um, I mean, I was always like curious about the heroic tradition of urban planning, yada, yada, but none of that was ever useful for me, like working and struggling like in the bureaucracy. Um, and it was that book that my friend, uh, Dr. Ana Baptista, had pointed out to me that really, I think, just told a realistic story of like what lies before you when you work in a municipal planning office. And then the last thing that we did um, uh, was a special issue of this now defunct, this sounds very hipster, this now defunct German architecture magazine from the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s called On Architecture. And the amazing thing about this, uh, about this issue was it was this, uh, this, these German people who were really interested in the US majorly tradition of community design. So, you know, that includes everything from community design centers, you know, attached to universities, you know, to the, all of the multitude of things that people have tried uh, from, you know, at least the 1960s till today in terms of uh, neighborhood design assistance centers and technical support and all these kinds of things. And so, even though I had never seen it kind of nicely packaged, they did an issue where they actually traveled the country and uh, republished some classic texts and just did an index of kind of what a broad definition of that movement might look like in terms of the specific organizations. It was, incre it was incredible and then it had the Saul Alinsky uh, kind of tactics at the, at the very end, uh, which is kind of an inspirational text for all community activism. So uh, yeah, that was an amazing collection. Thank you for sharing that. Um, other. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I think what really stood out to me was the, um, the, the, the circle of placemaking where you know, the community sort of informs and designs or, or informs and strengthens the design and planning and then the design and the plan strengthens the community. But um, what, what really um, I would like to understand from you is how do you deal with the conflict of where the community is so vibrant? There's all these different parts of the community, all these different pieces that are not just different, but often opposing to each other. So how do you gauge that? How do you gauge responses from community in the sense that everybody's voice is heard and not just the loudest voice? Great question. Well, I mean, I think maybe to reiterate something that you said, Jay, Place politics is a hell of a lot bigger than us and any project that we're working on, right? And so sometimes I feel like community engagement, public participation, they're kind of now, like I was meeting these uh, students from the US that were like, they were very frustrated with their school and they're like, and we even got the, the social engagement certification. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, like somehow, like you know, we're still having these still problems. Happening. You know, like what in the world? Um, you know, and, and so sometimes I think these, these things are talked about, like you know, they're an additional professional service, right? That now has to be learned by the design professions, and even beyond that, of course, now it's its own subsector of the consultant economy, right? Um, and I mean, I'll share one like quite educational experience. 
um, where I met my first ever public engagement consultant. And he was you know, a very charming, captivating person. Uh, the name of the firm, which I won't say exactly, was basically like, like Justice and Peace Incorporated. <laughs> but when he got alone with me and the mayor, he's like, what I'm gonna give you is a bulletproof process, right? And that's exactly the dynamic you know, that we've created. And so, you know, I think that for us, like remembering how much bigger local politics is, you know, than us or our project and how much deeper, you know, history is means a lot of times like those things aren't our choice to make, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I think like some of the work with like Mifflin Square Park, you know, our contributions were not to be like, you be quiet now and like you speak up and like you're important and like you, you know, it wasn't like that at all, but by making like a couple little models or different variations of drawings, we could actually provide a lot of like maybe useful furniture for the possibility of an actual problem solving process, right? Where the architect is not like dominating, the like local politicians are not dominating, the, the most property landowner or, or homeowner is not dominating. So, you know, I don't think we would be so uh, brave uh, to say that we uh, can, with our four hands or you know whoever else is with us, you know hold you know justice in a world that is so clearly like not that right. But I think what we can do is be really well informed, really try to create relationships, and bring our skills as designers in a way that fits these larger and smaller opportunities that open up in any process of building something, right? And that goes for like the richest museum trustees who are trying to raise a capital fund to build something. Like that is a drama adventure if you've been through that. You know, just like Mifflin Square Park is. I mean, I think it's really important something you said in the beginning of your talk to say, you know, um, conflict is essential in a democracy. And the problem with the professionalization of consulting, uh, uh, community consultation is that it sometimes is a process where, okay, we are going to, there's, there's a plan, or shall we say a vision, on the table, and um, their job is to create consensus around it. Um, not to open up a process where um, change or transformation of a set of goals is going to happen by actually engaging in the vision of a series of competing parties, right? That's what consultation and co conflict should produce, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, designers, as you say, can can play a kind of um, catalytic role in that. But too often, um, it's a, just about a mitigation of the risk of conflict, right? Yeah. Well, and, you know, and this goes back to the drawing to drawing battles. I mean, we know that we're losing, whether we're on the design team or maybe working for some people who are opposing a project, we're losing unless the drawings are on the table, right? If the develop developer is like, no way am I gonna pay my architect to talk to you, <laughs> like that conversation is not going very far. But if who's ever in, in conflict or whoever is coming at, at a project actually has to look at a drawing and say like, all right, well, I know, you know we're talking about like it's gonna happen or not, but in the end, you know, we're like with the, plaza in front of the Prudential building that we quickly showed. You know, it's gonna be six feet off the sidewalk or four feet off the sidewalk or two feet off the sidewalk, right? Like the things that we do when it comes to construction drawings are not like abstract philosophical truths. It's like moving stuff around like with dimensions, right? And so we really firmly believe, and we'll see if it works in this latest little adventure, that even if the, st if the odds seem you know, slim at best, that we're gonna work really hard to try to get a drawing in front of those people so they're actually dealing with like the physical realities, right, that are, are all at the heart of, uh, you know, of these issues, even and, though they're and, attached and, to everything yeah, else. Yeah, and then there's a third thing that you all have to, you all have to contend with instead of it being about you know, the two people personalities, right? Well, and it's no longer a binary yes, no question, right? It's, it's all of a sudden like a multivariable, you know, 20-dimensional chess question like building anything is. Um, I think that's good. I really uh, um, thank you for bringing this work for us to see and for uh, coming and being with us today at the, at the, at the uh, workshop. And um, I guess we'll stand around a little bit if people have one-on-one uh, -on -one questions. And, um, 
and uh, uh, invite all of you to come to our upcoming uh, public programming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.